An ordinary shift for a police officer. This case came in as just another burglary. This is an offence we have seen quite a lot of. Can quickly take an extraordinary turn. It's gone from zero to 100 in no time at all. A routine case. Just thought we were picking up someone who's maybe just a bit drunk and disorderly. Can suddenly spiral into a serious incident. I need to arrest you on suspicion of murder. The more I dig, the more I find. How big was this case going to get? He has started a fire, he's done it deliberately and used some kind of fuel to get that fire going. Sometimes the most minor crimes... It's really important that we get hold of him as quickly as possible and get him off the street. ..can crack major cases. We did have an international manhunt on our hands. Gotcha. Today on Big Little Crimes, a car thief realises police are on his tail. It was overtaking vehicles and using the hard shoulder to manoeuvre itself through and away from the police. And risks catastrophe trying to escape. And he had no regards for the safety of other road users or himself. Hey, hands up, mate! Stay there, stay there! But first, a detective investigating a heartless fraud. The more I dig, the more I find. <coughs> Uncovers a criminal enterprise on an unbelievable scale. How big was this case going to get? I'm thinking this guy is a, just a one-man crime spring. Detective Constable Becky Mason specialises in investigating a specific type of crime known as romance fraud. I think I have become an expert in broken hearts, you know, lived it, investigate it. I'm your pro. <laughs> romance fraud is essentially a scam or a trick which involves an element of romance, hence the romance, and an element of lying, hence the fraud. So you will get suspects purporting to be someone else online, so using stolen photos and, and giving their character um, this life that doesn't exist. And then they use that persona that they have created to trick the victims into forming a, a relationship with them. Becky knows it's a crime that can have a lasting impact. Romance fraud is cruel and it is heartless because it goes beyond the realm of fraud. You know, taking someone's money is hard enough. You have got their emotions in play as well, which is why it is so devastating for these people. In 2021, Becky is investigating an organised crime group suspected of fraud. As she looks through bank statements of accounts linked to the group, she sees something that raises her suspicions. Going through bank account after bank account after bank account, and there was one payment into a suspect's bank account from a victim that didn't look right, and I can't explain why. It just didn't fit in with the pattern of the other fraud that was being committed. Although the payment is small, it catches Becky's eye. It was for around about £400, so not earth-shattering. When I was looking back through other transactions into this other account, there was thousands and thousands and thousands going through from numerous people. And this was for 400 quid. Like, I don't know what it was. Don't know what it was, but there was something about it that I didn't like. Copper's nose, isn't it? Copper's nose. And she can't ignore her instinct. For the years I've been investigating this sort of crime type, it gave me that feeling of, this isn't right. I knew that rabbit hole I needed to go down. And I was going to go down it. <laughs> and off I went, trying to look into to who this person was that had paid this £400. Becky finds out that this £400 payment has been made by a pensioner. So she decides to give him a call. So I spoke to the victim and he was somewhat shocked that I was ringing him. I went out to see him, sat down, and just had a conversation with him and explained to him, look, we've seen you've paid some money into this person's account, £400. What's it for? 
Becky starts to realise there's much more to this than she first suspected. He believed he was in a relationship online with someone by the name of Fred Williams, provided a photo, but I knew Fred Williams was not the name of the person whose account I'd originally seen this money go into. So everything was screaming, you are a victim of fraud. Then she discovers this payment wasn't a one-off. The victim has been transferring money to another account too, and for a long time. They built up this relationship over a 15 year period, but they'd never met, never met. When someone turns around to you saying that they've sent money continuously over a 15 year period and they can't recall how much has been sent, it sort of raises alarm bells. 15 years, well, we knew we were looking at some serious money then. Becky realises that this man is likely a victim of romance fraud, and on a massive scale. Looking at this one payment, I knew it was something. I knew it was something worth exploring, but I did not know just the extent um, of what it would uncover. But before the full magnitude of the fraud is revealed, she must first tell the victim that their 15-year-long relationship is a sham. So when I said, the person you are speaking to, I don't think exists, it was, I could almost see the cogs going round in his head trying to compute, because how do you deal with that? You know, you've been speaking to someone that, for that long, they know everything about you everything, this relationship had been building up over all this time, and then I come in and tell them that everything is a lie. Not only that, that this money you've lent this person, that he has reassured you time and time again that you're gonna get back, is gone. How can someone deceive someone for so long? Like, what kind of person does that? It is vile. Now she's determined to find the fraudsters and bring them to justice. So initially, we had to look at the victim's bank accounts, which he gave us permission to do. And as soon as we started looking at those accounts, we could see this money was being sent to Frederick DG. Further investigation reveals that Frederick DG is a Nigerian staying in the UK illegally and living with his partner. And they'd been taking money from the victim for years. So we're searching through banking evidence, we can see that the figure is going up and up and up. Around £100,000 just from this one victim. What started with a suspicious payment of just £400 has turned into a massive £100,000 fraud. How big was this case going to get? We didn't know, but it was not off to a wonderful start. It's a staggering amount of money, and Becky doesn't know how many more victims there might be. The only way we could find out what was going on is by speaking with Frederick DG and his girlfriend. So that was our next stage. We needed to find out who they were, why they were getting this money through their account. Becky wants to bring the fraudsters in for questioning and plans a raid on their house. I've gathered enough evidence that satisfied a court that were able to issue me with a warrant to um, kick his door in. Till I'd been inside that house, there were so many bits of the puzzle still missing. I was putting them together, but at this point I only had the corner pieces and I needed that whole middle bit doing, you know? I, I didn't have enough. It's the morning of the raid and Becky is nervous. I was anxiously sat in the office with my radio thinking, this is going to go one way or the other. Either we're going into the door of some innocent party or I have found my two key suspects. It was, there was no in-between at this point. It was one or the other. <laughs> Our next story begins with a crime police in Kent encounter every day. Burglary. Canterbury is a very busy city and it's a reasonably affluent area as well, which makes it a target sometimes for criminals. One September morning, DC Andy Palmer and his team are alerted to a burglary 
where the target appears to have been the keys to the homeowner's cars. In the early hours of the morning, two motor vehicles were stolen. Police investigate this car key burglary and eventually find both cars. But there's bad news. One of them is a total write-off. Attempts have been made to burn that vehicle out and it would appear that the suspects were trying to destroy the evidence. Then police are alerted to a second burglary nearby. And once again, it looks like the house has been broken into in order to steal car keys. There was a high-value motor vehicle on the driveway of that property. However, the homeowner was away at the time and had hidden the keys. So we suspected that the vehicle was the true target. The two burglaries could be connected, but who's behind them and why? Andy finds a clue in the burnt-out car stolen in the first break-in. It didn't appear that it was for financial gain. It appeared to us that it was more driven for entertainment purposes. If Andy's hunch is right, they're dealing with a highly reckless criminal. Then police get a breakthrough. There's an eyewitness to the first burglary. They believe that the offenders arrived in a white Peugeot 5008, which gave us our first lead. He realises that this car is at the centre of a local crime wave. We searched the force computers and it appeared the day previous to the burglaries there was a Peugeot involved in some dangerous driving. That Peugeot was in fact stolen a few days prior to the burglaries. Then the investigation gets another boost. This car has an inbuilt SIM card. And just like a mobile phone, its general location can be detected. We could track to some degree its movements. We were confident that it was still operated in our policing area. And just a few days later, officers finally catch sight of the car with two men in it. But as soon as they see the police, they're off. Officers follow in pursuit. But then, the driver goes to horrifying lengths and rams the police car, forcing them to give up the chase. The abandoned vehicle was found minutes later with the engine running and the doors open. The two men are now on foot and nowhere to be seen. But officers aren't giving up the hunt. Police dogs were called down to the area and they managed to pick up a trail from the vehicle to a nearby flat and found two offenders lying in bed, pretending to be asleep. They're fooling no one. Police arrest them both and bring them in. One of the men is 29-year-old Shane Seymour, a London lad who's known to the police. The picture we built up was of two relatively young males who appeared to be living a fairly nomadic lifestyle, committing various crimes from breaking into vehicles to steal credit cards and bank cards, to buy cigarettes and food and alcohol, all the way up to breaking into people's homes and stealing their motor vehicles. But Seymour denies any involvement with the crimes, and without concrete evidence, he's bailed. Andy and his team go back through CCTV from the theft of the Peugeot that first led them to Seymour, and they find a crucial clue. We could see that the offenders who stole that vehicle arrived in a large black Audi Q7. And it turns out the Audi is yet another stolen car. What started as a single burglary now involves multiple vehicles worth tens of thousands of pounds. This case just keeps growing. I was able to build up a picture of exactly what has been going on over the last month or so. What Andy finds is a level of law-breaking beyond anything he'd ever expected. It had been using the stolen Audi and the stolen Peugeot to fill up and then make off without paying for that petrol. We obtained CCTV footage of him using stolen credit cards that had been stolen from break-ins 
and we also built up a picture of various number plates he'd been stealing in an effort to disguise the true identity of the vehicles he was driving. But in the midst of this crime spree, Seymour has slipped up. We had some fingerprints that were recovered from vehicles where number plates had been stolen, and we were able to link those fingerprints to Mr Seymour. An arrest warrant is issued, but now they must find him. We suspected that he'd be sleeping on sofas. He was a very difficult individual to keep tabs on. But while they're searching for him, another vehicle is stolen. We were notified of a theft of a Range Rover. A member of the public had sighted the stolen vehicle near the Canterbury city centre. Andy doesn't know who's behind the wheel, but he does know that the driver has no intention of being caught. The driver of that vehicle made off at speed. Let's make it off. The pursuit went on for around half an hour in speeds of excess of 100 miles an hour. The reckless driver is taking huge risks. It was overtaking vehicles and using the hard shoulder to manoeuvre itself through and away from the police. The results could be catastrophic. The force throw everything at stopping the stolen car. There are several vehicles involved in the pursuit. The situation is now critical. The police helicopter is scrambled to join the effort. It's a high-pressured scenario. Officers are making constant decisions, minute by minute, second by second. With the car thief desperate to evade police, he drives even more recklessly, and it leads to disaster. The Range Rover was travelling fast speeds when it left Junction 3 and did not stop for the red light that was at the top of the slip road on the roundabout. And the Range Rover collided, causing extreme damage and injury to the occupants of that vehicle. The driver has caused a devastating crash, but he cares nothing for his seriously injured victims and makes off on foot. <laughs> Ambulances arrive to take the two casualties to hospital, while police continue to hunt for the runaway driver. The longer he's outstanding, the harder it will be to link him to this extremely serious collision. The driver had gone through heavy woodlands in order to uh, avoid detection. Then police get a lucky break. The driver's spotted exiting the woodland onto a nearby street, and they quickly close in on him. Put your hands up, mate! Stay there, stay there! Only then do the officers discover the driver's identity. You can imagine my surprise when I was informed that the driver of this vehicle, Shane Seymour. He was hot, he was sweaty, he was out of breath. He was also covered in scratches, the kind of scratches you'd expect to see to someone who may have made off through bushes and trees. Nothing, you can't just risk someone on the street, mate. His reckless driving, ending in a hit and run, tells Andy everything he needs to know about Shane Seymour. It was clear that his offending was ramping up in seriousness and his disregard for his own safety as well as everybody else's. And I knew at this point he needed to be stopped. Seymour has committed a staggering 33 separate thefts across just two months. We estimated that the offending for Mr Seymour totaled in excess of £100,000. And that doesn't include the values of the cars he's nicked. That takes the figure much, much higher. The behaviour has escalated exponentially over a, a short period of time, only a month, from stealing number plates, stealing bank cards, to breaking into people's houses, stealing motor vehicles and fuel and then making off with police in the most dangerous way and threatening the lives of other road users. Seymour shows no remorse and won't admit his guilt. And Andy notices other worrying personality traits too. He could become extremely aggressive at the drop of a hat, which made him a dangerous individual, rash in his decision-making. Then, 
Forensic evidence from the stolen Range Rover provides the final blow to Seymour's defense by proving he was driving the car in the hit and run. At a later hearing, Mr. Seymour decided to enter a guilty plea and the judge sentenced him to five years and five months in custody. He had no regard for the victims who he stole from and he had no regards for the safety of other road users or himself. He was only out to commit crimes for his own pleasure. This investigation showed me the importance of looking at those smaller crimes because it can unearth some of the more serious offenders and offences. Back in London, police are about to raid the home of a pair of suspected fraudsters. Detective Constable Becky Mason believes they're behind a romance scam that's cost victims hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's early morning when the team arrives at the house. And quickly put the door in. In the house, they find Frederick DG and his partner, as well as a mountain of evidence. They're on their way to custody, fantastic. As they're on their way, I'm getting phone calls from the officers at the address. Like, there is a lot of paperwork here, and there's a lot of mobile phones here. But there was another two laptops. There was another three mobile phones. Well, why? Why are there so many mobile phones? We're starting to get along the realms of, uh-oh. That's the only way to describe it, because any electronic device, we always think uh-oh, because they just hold so much information. And I knew that very quickly I was about to find out who I was dealing with. But all of this evidence must first be examined before the suspects can be charged. So in the meantime, detectives have to let them go. We had to bail them. We couldn't hold them, we didn't have enough. And although the suspects have walked free for now, Becky starts uncovering the true scale of their crimes. There was so much, so much material to go through. I mean, you imagine a smartphone, how much data that can hold. On every single device, there was evidence. And not just a little bit of evidence, not just one message here and there. This thing was like a minefield of evidence. You name it, I had it. And it, and it was sort of reading through this stuff that I'm thinking, this cannot be real. I cannot be sitting through here and getting this much evidence from the phone. DG has even recorded and shared details of exactly how he's scamming his victims. He was discussing how to commit fraud. He's doing voice notes to friends of his, saying, you know, you've got to make sure you send love messages first. A little process before they release the money. As they send them love message for one or two days, then later, they thank her for the money we give you, you understand. Never ask for money straight away. You send love messages first, and then you say afterwards that your mother has died and that you need money for a funeral and that you, uh, then you get an inheritance through. And that is his voice on this voice note to a friend of his. And the investigation just keeps getting bigger. DG is targeting lonely, older gay men, and the more police look at his phones, the more victims they find. Now, bear in mind, these men were not openly gay. They were older, so not, not used to a society where it's so acceptable. So they were, I was one of the first people that they told, A, that they were gay, and B, about the job. So that is huge. That is huge. I must have spoken to around about 20 other victims on this device. We're up against the clock here. Out of those 20, I actually had four, four statements that I put to the CPS in order to get Frederick DG and his girlfriend charged jointly with conspiracy. Now she has enough evidence to charge DG and his accomplice, Becky plans a second raid on their house. I'm planning it, I can't wait to see the look on his face when I tell him he's not coming out of prison. All of this stuff is going on in my head and I am excited at this point. That was my first mistake. But the raid doesn't go as planned. So, 
officers go round to the address. Bang in the door again. Yep. He's gone. He's gone. And that was devastating. Because not only did I know he was still offending, how do you find a needle in a haystack? He was a nasty piece of work to my victims. He did not care what he did to get this money, he would get this money. But Becky has a trump card. DG's partner was at the house and is now in custody. And she gives officers DG's new mobile number and asks them to tell him she's been arrested. So, I rang him on the number that she gave me. I rang him and I said, Fred, we've got your girlfriend in custody. And he was devastated, devastated we'd nicked her again. He may have no sympathy towards my victims or anything like that, but he did for her. And I said, Fred, I need to talk to you. You know why I need to talk to you. And he said he would hand himself in. And he did. When interviewed in custody, he says nothing. But the evidence against DG just keeps growing. That we are really going through this phone with a fine tooth comb. We had enough evidence as it was. All we were doing was finding more and more, and it was getting more and more damning. We're finding more and more victims. 10, 20, 30, 40. The number is just going up. And I'm thinking this guy is a, just a one-man crime spree. And the more I dig, the more I find, and it was just never-ending. It was never-ending. We're talking about 170 victims, nearly half a million pounds. Despite this, when the case comes to court, Frederick DG denies all the charges. But after the first day, as the vast amounts of evidence are presented to the jury, he gives up and pleads guilty. So he got sentenced to eight years, um, and she got sentenced to three and a half, just over three and a half. Immediate. There and then, straight into custody. No pass and go. They were, they were locked up. For Becky, all the hard work and her dogged investigation have finally paid off. This will be the highlight of my career. I have never had to work so hard on a case to get it to court from someone that was so defiant and, and refusing to admit their guilt. And just having that overwhelming evidence. But it all come from a hunch. That hunch was right. Feels good. It feel, feels good to know I still got it. Next time, what starts with a routine stop ends up with a rookie cop facing a horrific scene. I just took, I think, three seconds to just sort of absorb what I could see. I wasn't expecting to find that at all. A drunken evening has spiralled into something far more serious. I need to arrest you. I need to, listen, I need to arrest you on suspicion of murder.